just remember before I start, you must always sink before surrender. And that's exactly the attitude of many of the ships in the North Atlantic Squadron, the Hampton Roads Station. Now I'm going to pop through all these different ships real quickly. Of course, this is Hampton Roads. Uh, you can see right up here, the Cumberland, the Congress. Now the Minnesota actually begins the day right over here next to Fort Monroe. The Roanoke is next to it. And right there on the other side of the channel is where the St. Lawrence will begin, or that's where they'll be on the evening of March 7th. Um, I have to say that there's some unique ships that are going to be in the squadron in Hampton Roads. It's actually called a station because the squadron commander, like Officer Louis Malchibrez, Goldsboro is actually down in North Carolina supporting the Burnsides, of course, Brigadier General Ambrose Everett Burnsides uh, capture of Roanoke Island. So, which is very important because the grand strategy we're having right now is that we want to cut off the supplies flowing up to Norfolk from North Carolina. We want to capture this really great Eastern Carolina uh, resource of food and so forth. And by threatening Norfolk in that fashion, we will then be able to move a big army to Fort Monroe. And so that's going to be part of our tale today. Now, so the Congress is um, a uh, sailing ship. This is one of my favorite images. This is this is March 7, 1862. Do they think they're waiting for something? Well, they have been waiting for some time. And you see in this image, <clears throat> the Congress and the Cumberland. And the Congress is a frigate. And the um, good old Cumberland was a frigate, but it was razied down to be a sloop. And we'll go into that in just a little detail. There's the Cumberland at sea as a sloop. Now, I'm going to mention a lot of these little armed tugboats. Now, I have a big problem with this picture because it's all said that Dragon is in the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. But what's wrong with this picture to make that true? Well, uh, if you notice in the foreground off to the left, that happens to be a city class ironclad. Oh my gosh. And the one behind us is the you know, so and it is a combination of a casemate and a turreted ship. Where do they all serve? In the Mississippi River. Now I cannot find a USS Dragon assigned to that squadron, but this is said, this is part of the uh, view uh, of uh, of, of the dragon. And so all the gunboats I'm going to mention, they're often armed with two guns. Uh, and uh, they are going to be in Hampton Roads for many serious reasons. Ah, the Minnesota, which is the most powerful ship in the squadron. Uh, his commit that commander of that ship happens to be Captain Gershon Jacques Henry Van Brunt. And what a name. Uh, so we'll go in more detail about him. And the Roanoke, sister ship to the Minnesota, which is also sister ship to the Merrimack. Okay, in fact, that ship is part of what's known as the Merrimack class, which is supposed to be six frigates, but instead they're five steam screw frigates, all armed between 42 and 47 guns. So this is the man who's going to be in command of the station in Hampton Roads. This man is, of course, John Marsden, and he will eventually become a rear admiral. Uh, he is, is one person that's going to make certain decisions that are going to really save the Union fleet, but not on March 7th. All he does is complain on that day, and I'll give you some quotes. Uh, there's, once again, the Congress... Um, the St. Lawrence is the one right on the, uh, actually it's right off of the lighthouse. 
So if you think about Hampton Roads and you get to the lighthouse, just look to the left, and she's actually anchored as a gateway from Hampton Roads into the Chesapeake Bay. She's got uh, 40, 50 guns, so it's a pretty powerful ship. And this is a man that, uh, of course, is part of the ironclad board, and so he has some thoughtful things about what's happening right before it all takes place in Hampton Road. And this is his son, Lieutenant Joseph B. Smith. And he uh, uh, will be, uh, he will be killed on March 8th. Um, and uh, so, but we don't want to talk about that yet. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so um, I'm going to give you a bunch of characteristics and then I'm going to tell you another there's going to be a two part thing. So we're going to think about the ships as they actually functioned. And then we're going to talk about how these people are reacting from October to March of 1862, because it's amazing what they're thinking and saying. So this is a Merrimack class vessel, USS Minnesota, named for the Minnesota River, believe it or not. It was launched, it was built at the Washington Navy Yard. What's so odd about that is that it has a draft of 23 feet. And if you know the Potomac, that meant it could only come out of the Potomac on certain conditions. But the Washington Navy Yard was really transitioning from building ships into actually dealing with ordnance. Uh, and that's thanks to the leadership of John Abel Bernard Dahlgren. Wow. So anyway, this ship is going to be sails, of course, and is also going to have a two cycle horizontal trunk engine with four Martin glass tube boilers, all right? And also has sails. This is one of the problems with ships at this time. We have two different motive powers. And, and, and basically, having a sailing ship means you have to have a different type of hull than a steamship. And so we're mixing these two technologies. And the Merrimack class was noted uh, to have rolled very hard in the waves. In fact, Kate Spiap Roger Jones says any Merrimack class vessel is a bad gun platform. Why do we have the ships? To be gun platforms. So you can see the marrying of these two types of uh, you know, technologies do not work well. This ship can go 8.9 knots, believe it or not. It is actually the one of the most powerful armed ships in Hampton Roads. It's going to have a one 10 inch shell gun and pivot, 28 nine inch shell guns, and 14 eight inch shell guns two 24 pounder housers and two 12 pounder smooth boards. What do they have those little guns for? Well, in case there's a, sh a boat party trying to capture your ship, they can really blow you out. And uh, so basically prior to 1862, the frigate originally was part of the East India Squadron. Um, it was gonna be commanded by Captain Francis, Samuel Francis DuPont and um, it will remain part of that until 1859. Now remember, this ship goes into service 1855. By 1859, it's going to be decommissioned. These ships are expensive to operate. These ships have flaws in their engine systems. You know, this is all new stuff. And so that makes this ship um, right away is going to be recommissioned, refitted, and placed under the command of Gershon Jacques Henry Van Brunt. Uh, now, it will be assigned to Hampton Roads, the, at that time the Atlantic Blockading Squadron. As such, it will participate in the capture of Hatteras Inlet, 28 to 29 August 1861, under the command of Flag Officer Silas Horton Stringham. Okay. Now, we had a question beforehand. I just want to explain these ranks for just for a moment. You know, um, the new Navy of the 1850s, as it's making this transition, doesn't want to call people Commodore anymore because it's a temporary rank. So they think it's better 
to call the people in command of squadrons and navy yards as flag officer. That meant they had got to have their own flag uh, to just indicate where they are. And so that's very, very important. We don't see admirals until after 30 April 1862. So that's a very minor distinction, uh, but I kind of like those things. And uh, so, uh, anyway, so believe it or not, this ship captures 20 blockade runners uh, in its short career in Hampton Roads. And how does it do it? Well, when the war breaks out, the Confederates just think, oh, we we're going to sail here and there. We're just going to go past the uh, you know, Union ships. And all of a sudden they said, well, no, you're not. And so actually Van Brunt becomes a very wealthy man because you capture a blockade runner, it becomes a prize, it goes to prize court. And so they evaluate the cargo and the ship and then everyone gets a cut. So you wanted to capture blockade runners. Um, I don't want him yet. Uh, so um, the companion ship uh, steam, uh, that's a steam screw frigate is gonna be the Roanoke. Now the Roanoke, uh, let me find that bad boy again, um, is going to uh, be um, actually um, named for the Roanoke River. These ships are all named for rivers. And it actually was built at Gosport Navy Yard, today's Norfolk Navy Yard. And as a result of that, when they launch her, guess what happens? She immediately sinks. You know, so they got to pump her out, you know, fix her up. Uh, the engines are made at Methy um, Ironworks. So they also build the Colorado, which is another sister ship to the Roanoke and the Minnesota. And that and those engines will be built at Tredegar Ironworks. So, you know, we're really experimenting with the types of engines we have. This uh, ship had a draft of 23.9 feet. Uh, of course, she could go 8.8 .8 knots. Um, and when, after they pull her up off the uh, bottom of the Elizabeth River, uh, James B. Montgomery is going to take command. Now, Montgomery is going to be a major actor in actually the start of the Civil War, which I'll talk about in a different lecture. So just trying to keep your hands on here. Um, so, um, look, I can't keep this straight. Uh, so uh, basically, the next ship I want to talk about is going to be the um, Cumberland. And we can see it in this picture right here. That is Camp Butler. You have to, you have to realize the Federals, by March 7th, 1862, have over 200 cannon on shore batteries. That's Fort Monroe alone has 179 guns mounted, right? You can see uh, three or four of these at the water battery at Camp Butler. Then the Union fleet in Hampton Roads has 217 guns cannon. So, you know, that's a formidable force. And so the Cumberland is actually was laid down in 1824. However, uh, the Navy became very parsimonious and they left it in a ship house, right? And then all of a sudden they said, well, maybe we should finish it. It's at the Charleston Navy Yard in Boston where she's going to be built. So they go back and launch the ship. Um, it, now remember, it was laid down in 1824. 1842 is when they finally launch it as a real ship. And as a frigate, um, it uh, was uh, uh, 1,726 tons. Now, actually, they will cut her down, Razi, which is uh, uh, what they did to ships. See, a frigate has to have a lot more men than a sloop. And so the Navy was always worried about how much money they were spending. So to extend the life of a ship, they would cut down the ship so that it would be a sloop rigged and sloop gunned ship. So basically the Cumberland is, I think the second most powerful ship 
in the Hampton Road Squadron. I have to say that uh, it's going to be armed with one tenant's Dahlgren shell gun pivot on the and then they also have a controversial gun is a 70 pounder rifle gun. Now you see this in everyone writing, but the US Navy did not have a 70 pounder gun. So it's got to be a 60 pounder, but nevertheless, you know, the Confederates know all about them having that gun. And so that's gonna make a difference. So she also have 20 uh, nine inch Dahlgren guns. It was part originally of the Raritan class, um, which was enacted in 1816 as an act for the gradual increase of the Navy of the United States. They were gonna build ships line, they were gonna build frigates, it was gonna be a huge fleet. And half of them, this was, there, after the War of 1812, there was this naval board headed by Stephen Decatur, right? You know, a naval hero. So he's gonna say, well, we want to build a whole bunch of ships, two thirds done. And then we're going to store them in ship houses because if Britain declares war on us, it's going to take them several months to get over here. And so we have to make sure we have two ships of the line in, in all of our major ports. So, um, and frigates. So basically, um, this will serve a great deal in the Mediterranean. Um, actually, during the Mexican War, it will be commanded by Captain French Forrest. Um, and uh, it will actually, one cruise in the Mediterranean, they have on board um, Louis Malchibrez Goldsboro, Silas Stringham, John Worden, and Howard Skib, Scribb. And that is the famous pharmaceutical company founder. Uh, he's a naval surgeon. So this is a really great ship. When it gets a reside, actually at the Charlestown Navy Yard, actually it will be placed on the African slave patrol. We're anti-slave trade. And so um, the ship, because it's a sailor, it can stay out to sea for a longer time period. So that makes it very, very important. Uh, what we, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, we're going to, uh, see uh, that um, there are other smaller ships, other bigger ships as well. St. Lawrence is one of them. St. Lawrence is named for the St. Lawrence River, built at Gosport Navy Yard uh, and laid down in 1826, but not finished until August of 1848, believe it or not. So it sat in the ship house for 20 years. So to operate the ship, you had to have 480 men um, and officers and crew. Uh, the St. Lawrence had been updated uh, with its weaponry. So it had 10 eight inch shell guns, 24 32 pounder and 16 32 pounders of earlier visits. And these 32 and 42 pounders are actually shell guns in the Paxahans design. Yeah. We're gonna go beyond that because when you mentioned Dahlgren's, that is the most perfected shell gun that there is. Um, now, uh, the Congress is going to be made, whoopsie, I don't want him. Uh, the um, Congress is going to be made in uh, the uh, Portsmouth Navy Yard. Um, it will actually uh, be a fabulous ship. It has four eight-inch shell guns, 48 32 pounders. It was in the Mediterranean. It served in the Brazil squadron. It actually captured an Argentine schooner on 29 September 1844 during the Uruguayan Civil War. However, the commander, Philip Voorhees, is going to be court-martialed for that. You don't do those things. Um, nevertheless, um, we are going to uh, realize that Congress plays a big role on the Baja Peninsula during the Mexican War. Actually, we capture the state, Mexican state of Sonora, as well as Baja Peninsula. However, we give it back. Now, so we had a bunch of little, little boats and we saw that picture of the dragon. We also have what is known as the USS Suave. Now, what happens when the war breaks out? The Federals say, oh my gosh, we don't have enough ships. 
And so we have to buy, and they kind of go out and buy ships. Some of the ships are bad. Some of the ships are pretty good. Uh, the Dragon is a pretty good one. Zouave was named for, of course, the French infantry units, light infantry. And it was actually built in Albany, New York. It has two 32-pounder, uh, 30-pounder uh, rifles. And it would be commanded by Master Harry Reiner. Um, there's also the Whitehall, uh, which I have to say, the U.S. Navy made a big mistake when they bought this paddler, right? And why? Uh, because she is engine system, even though she's built in 1850. As Goldsboro will say about the ship, it's the worst sea boat of all ferry boats. Certainly the most unfortunate. The Whitehall actually was surveyed March 1, 1862, and they said that the paddler's machinery and hull were badly deteriorated. The ship should remove from service. Well, they have that ship there because it also functions as a tugboat. So that's why we have the Zouave. That's why we have the um, Whitehall, that's why we have the Cambridge, um, which is actually built in 1859. It's a pretty good, now believe it or not, the Cambridge had a two-mast rig, schooner rig, as well as a um, screw propeller. The Dragon we're looking at right now is another one of those ships in Hampton Roads, and it will be bought in 1861 uh, from a builder in Buffalo. Now, so let's get to some real stuff now. In late February of 1862, Major General George Britton McClellan was planning his major assault against Richmond, Virginia by use of the Chesapeake Bay. First concept is to go up the Rappahannock River. It then changes to going up the James and York River. But the big thing is, this is a brilliant plan because the ships can carry his supplies, his men, and, and have guard their flanks and have actually a rapid movement. Now, he could only do this indirect approach, um, which is this thing that Winfield Scott did during the Mexican War, you know, the march on Mexico City. So the only way he could do all this is with the Navy support. So one issue about McClellan's plan was this thing called the Merrimack. Now I want to pause for a distinction. When you are talking as a Northern Naval officer, you always call it the Merrimack. If you are a uh, Confederate Naval officer, generally you'll call it the Virginia. Okay, so that's the distinction. And um, so I'm mostly going to say Merrimack today. Uh, and so now the Federals have been long aware of the conversion of the Merrimack. In fact, um, Flag Officer Silas Stringham wrote to Gideon Wells that the Merrimack was taken into dry dock, examined, and pronounced worthless, her machinery all destroyed. Nevertheless, more and more rumors came out about that Merrimack is being transformed into a ironclad ram. Now I'm going to tell you all right now that there's no secrecy during the Civil War. I probably have stressed this before because when they start converting the Merrimack, the Lynchburg, Virginia says, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> we're building an ironclad. We'll sink all the Union ships. The Union actually, when they get ready to build the Monitor and the Galena and the New Ironsides, they put out an RFP saying, ah, put in bids for building ironclads. So everybody knows what's going on. They just can't see what's in Norfolk. So Louis Machibres Goldsboro, and I like to tell you, you know, he is five foot 10. He's about 340 pounds. He doesn't do anything quickly. Um, it said at one dinner he ate an entire chicken and bounced his stomach. It says, monsterly good. So anyway, um, but he is in now. See, what happens is after the blockade board meets, they divide the Atlantic blockading squadron into the South Atlantic and North Atlantic blockade squadron. Stringham says, how can you do that to me? So he resigns as squadron commander. And then Goldsboro is the North Atlantic 
and just so happens Samuel Francis DuPont is going to be the South Atlantic. Now, as Goldsboro is in charge, he actually is continually bombarding Gideon Wells with reports about the Confederate ironclad. On 17 October 1861, Goldsboro wrote, I have received further minute, reliable information with regard to the pr preparation of the Merrimack for an attack on Newport News and these roads, and I am quite satisfied that unless her stability be compromised by heavy top works of iron and wood and her weight of batteries, she will be in all probability proved to be an extremely formidable foe. Well, so they know this thing's building, but you know, they don't know when it's gonna come out or anything like that. So remember the ships have 219 guns total. And that includes some little pop guns like uh, 12 pounder howitzers. But um, they also have supporting them, we mentioned the dragon. Now, why do they have the dragon Zouave? They are gonna be positioned at Newport News Point because if anything happens, you know, they are going to tow those ships into action, right? And also they have a supply ship called the Brandywine. And then they also have, of course, the Whitehall, which doesn't work very well, and the Cambridge. And they're assigned to the St. Lawrence because once again, if something happens, we got to tow these ships into action. Now, McClellan organized the Roanoke Island expedition and Goldsboro um, has to go south and support the, uh, you know, Burnside's action to capture Roanoke Island, New Bern, and eventually Beaufort, North Carolina. So before he leaves Hampton Roads, he brings all his captains together and he had develops a plan to how to deal with that ironclad if it does indeed come out. And uh, he says, we're going to bring all of our ships together against the enemy's warship. And the flag officer who actually once said at the beginning of the war, we need to have 30 ironclads to put those vile southerners on their knees. Wow. Um, and uh, so uh, basically, uh, Union doesn't do that. And so he knows what Ironclad can do. Uh, he actually knows McClellan fairly well. And the McClellan had written what is known as the Delafield Report. And the Delafield Report was U.S. Army obs and Navy observations on the Crimean War. How did the French subdue shell gun batteries like at Kinburn? Uh, well, they used iron case floating batteries. So that becomes very, very good. And so um, actually Goldsboro will say, nothing I think, but very close work can be of service in accomplishing the destruction of the Merrimack. And even of that, a great deal may be necessary. There were concerns that our ironclad or our wooden ships in Hampton Roads have no ironclads to support. So they actually felt at risk. And so basically, John Wool, commander of the Union Department of Virginia, um, will feared for the defense of Newport News Point. And so he asked Goldsboro to actually station uh, those ships right off of Newport News Point. And um, so, <clears throat> and they're to guard the entrance to the James River. Now I have to tell you, the commander of the Congress is a man known as William Smith. And he noted that the frigate's exposed position made it extremely vulnerable by an attack by the Merrimack. Smith wrote that although the Congress had been a model in her day, since all of its cannons were older smoothbores, we shall only be a good target for them, as none of our guns can throw shot into them. In fact, this ship is primarily armed with 32 pounder shell guns. Um, and also, um, Smith complains that he doesn't have enough veteran seamen. This is a big problem in the entire fleet in Hampton Roads during this time. 
And he actually says this is a serious deficiency. And on 21 January, he says, the present position of this ship threatened daily with attacks from Norfolk by the Merrimack and other steamers and from the James River by the Patrick Henry, the Thomas Jefferson and other steamers, submarine batteries, torpedoes and fire rafts. I regret to say it's impossible to do anything to defend this ship. Wow. Gideon Wells will tell him, look, I regret to say that we can't recruit enough people. And so this is uh, pretty serious. And you can't have a deficiency to man all your cannon. So as a result of this, General Wool will send to the Congress the John McIntyre's Company D of the 99th New York Infantry. So they become sailors. I don't know if all of them wanted to be, but uh, they were assigned to the Congress. And that's 88 men to bring the crew up. In other words, they can maintain an entire broadside. Now, um, and these men were all assigned as gunners on board the um, Congress. Now, the USS Roanoke, one of the more powerful steamers in Hampton Roads, not only suffered from a shortage of seamen, but it also required repairs. The Roanoke's engines were useless due to a broken crankshaft. When I think of this ship's crippled condition, no engine, 180 of her crew deficient, wrote Marsden, John Marsden. It makes me sick at heart. Seaman Joseph McDonald lamented, we sailors couldn't understand why the government should leave such a powerful ship in such a condition like that. The very threat of the pending excursion forced the Federals to maintain a powerful defense, and the Roanoke would have to be moved using a tug. And that kind of defeats the whole idea of having a shot-proof engine system. So this is pretty bad. Um, now, Marsden complained to Wells that the Roanoke could not be overhauled as long as the Merrimack is held as a rod over us. It makes me nervous. Wow. So uh, the Minnesota, as we have seen, is the uh, most powerful ship uh, in the and it's most powerful because its engines worked. Okay, that's a big thing. Uh, plus it was well armed, it had pivot guns, and basically the Minnesota is going to solve its, its recruitment problems because Van Brunt is an abolitionist. And so if you remember that in May of 1861, Major General Benjamin Franklin Butler had the contraband of war decision. And so here are all these former enslaved people and they're learning how to read and write, et cetera. And what does Van Brunt does, do? He goes and recruits from these contrabands. And um, he thinks this is great uh, that, uh, and he notes, you know, this is, I have to tell you, this is nothing new in the US Navy. U.S. Navy had a colorblind recruitment policy since the Revolutionary War. We estimate as much as 10% of the seamen in the Union fleet are going to be what? African descended people. Actually, the USS Hunchback is going to have over 30% of its crew as African Americans. Now, Van Brunt uh, actually has those early contrabands on board his ship when they go and fight the Battle of Hatteras Inlet. And he will comment that the, um, this is a quote, the Negroes fought energetically and bravely, none more so. They evidently felt that this, that they were working at the deliverance of their race. So you can just well imagine that you know, having this opportunity to recruit contrabands really solved many of the problems in Hampton Roads. Now, Hampton Roads, as we know, is an amphitheater for the impending battle. Even though the Confederates controlled South Side, they have several forts at Sewell's Point, Cranny Island, Pig Point, um, the Federals uh, controlled North Side with Fort Monroe, Camp Butler, Camp Hamilton. And, and so if they kind of every day look across the harbor and they see the flag at Fort Monroe and you see the flag at Sewell's Point. 
So they, you know, they know they're there. And um, so I have to say that um, Marsden placed his ships to seal off Hampton Roads in partnership with those fortifications. That's why he has the Minnesota, Roanoke, and St. Lawrence anchored just off Fort Monroe. That's why he has the Congress and Cumberland right off of Newport News Point, right in the middle of the channel. I mean, they're blocking the path of any vessel. Now, you have to realize, they keep hearing about the Merrimack time and time again. In fact, Marsden writes, I'm anxiously awaiting her and believe I am ready. Okay. Now, uh, rumors of her expected appearance came so often, said Lieutenant Thomas O. Selfridge, Jr. of the USS Cumberland, that it became a standing joke with the ship's company. Uh, you know, in other words, eh, it's not going to come again today. You know? and, and they're getting, see, there's a spy network which is sending information. And so every time, like, you'll get a report, the Merrimack's going to attack in five days on 16 February. Well, it doesn't. So, you know, everyone's anxious, but they don't know what else to do. Now, Marsden sent a message to Gideon Wells on 21 February saying, uh, by dispatch from General Wool, I learned that the Merrimack will positively attack Newport News within five days, acting in conjunction with Jamestown and Yorktown from the James River, and the attack will be at night. Well, this is false information, let me just tell you, because no pilot is going to take the deep draft Merrimack into Hampton Roads. So, um, but all this stuff is coming out, is making people anxious. And so throughout the entire winter, the crews on these ships are always active and ready for a chance to go into action against that ironclad. Um, and I have to tell you, Moses, master's mate Moses Stivent said that they had been on alert for the entire winter and everyone was waiting for a chance for active operations until every man knew not only the duties of their own station at quarters but those of every station as well. Now that's because they keep training and training and training. Ben Brunt probably tells us the most telling statement when he writes uh, Goldsboro. And he summed up the frustration of all these naval officers. And when he writes, we have nothing new here. All is quiet. The Merrimack is still invisible to us, but report says that she is ready to come out. I sincerely wish she would. I'm quite tired of hearing of her. The sooner she gives us the opportunity to test our strength, the, the better. And this is a letter dated March 5, 1862. So they get all these rumors and everything, so they're on alert, but they just, it never comes. So on the morning of March 8th, which is a Saturday, which is cleaning day on naval ships, actually the riggings of all the Union ships had the men's washing that was drying, you know? And, and so, and, and basically McClellan is really anxious because he hears about the Merrimack, he knows about ironclads, but he still has to make his campaign work. Otherwise McClellan's going to fire him, but he has to rely on the Navy. And on March 7th, 1862, it appears the Navy is as ready as it can be. Now, Marsden's going to write uh, Gustavus Vaza Fox, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and he's going to tell him that we need an ironclad. And Fox says, you are going to get one. Actually, Lincoln brings up in a cabinet meeting on March 5th, the Merrimack's going to come. What are we going to do? And Fox says, oh, we have no worry about that. We have our own ironclad, the Monitor, and she will make quick work of the Confederate Merrimack. And so, but the trouble is, the Monitor does not arrive at his plan to be. And so it's now 
you know, wooden ships against um, iron ship. And, you know, in Hampton Roads, no one knows on March 7th, 1862, that the tide of the war is going to change the next day. When the Virginia comes out, sinking the Congress in Cumberland and proving the power of iron over wood. Just remember when Rear Admiral Joseph Smith hears that the Congress had surrendered, he will say, well, my son Joe must be dead. And he was because he has the adage of what? To always sink before surrender. Thank you. Thank you, John. Question from anyone in the room? Yes, sir. Well, hold, hold one second so we can hear you. Thank you. John, these uh, ships they built in the 1820s and put up in the boathouses 20, 30 years or whatever, they must have had some wood rot and real problems when they brought them out. No, no, no. What they did is they put them in ship houses. And if you look, uh, I think the, one of the best ways to see what they did is look at Gosport Navy Yard before the burning. And you'll see two very large ship houses. By that time, they also were making the ships primarily out of live oak. And so it had that, I mean, Stephen uh, Decatur had really considered all of this. And you know, he knew that the British had an effective blockade during the War of 1812 because they kept ships of the lines off our ports. So we, if we kept two ships of the line in our ports, that meant that the Confederates had to have, or the, sorry, the British had to have twice as many to be effective. So it was a plan. Um, they did not use green wood. They actually had properly seasoned live oak, especially the knees and everything. So none of those ships are reported to be rotten. Now, I will tell you that during the Civil War itself, people will try to rip off the government and they build ships with green wood. And that is a no-no. And so anyway, so that's the answer. Olivia, we have any online questions? We do. We've got several coming in here. Okay. Um, our first is from John to John. <laughs> Why did the Roanoke sink on its launching? Well, um, it was, they're building two ships at the same time. They have one dry dock. The Colorado is in the dry dock. So when you go down the waves, you come into the water and they're Two different ways you can go um, uh, bow first or you can actually go uh, from the port side down and so that's how they did the roanoke so when it hits the water right it's going to hit the water like this and it heals over at first and guess what happens sometimes when you heal over water comes in and so so they they have a diving bell at uh, gosport navy yard so it wasn't a big deal. And this type of thing happened more often than you can believe. Uh, but uh, that's why they wanted to have dry docks. Dry docks meant I can fill the dry dock after I finished building it, make sure it floats. That was the big thing with the Virginia. When they floated it the first time, they went, oh my gosh, our displacement is off. And so we have to lower the ship so that we can be an ironclad. So, uh, uh, but yeah. Um, just depends on the Navy Yard. The first ship house was built at Sackett's Harbor during the War of 1812 because the weather is so bad up there, they wanted to build all winter long. And so they had a protective ship house to do that. So launching, yeah, I've been in a couple of launchings and uh, uh, especially smaller craft. And you know, when you go in the water like this, you go, <gasps> Right up here, Julian. Yes, sir. Were there any of the ships stored in the south that uh, the south could capture and use, like those like ones in houses? Well, um, yes, um, and um, the south is able 
to capture three Navy yards. One had been abandoned and that was the Memphis Navy Yard. So it only had some of the equipment there. The other one was the Pensacola Navy Yard and they do not have any ship houses because they've only built a few ships. Uh, Pensacola Navy Yard was founded by Lewis Warrington, a hero of the War of 1812, illegitimate son of the Comte de Rochambeau, believe it or not. And during the winter, uh, they spend in Williamsburg. So, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, uh, good old Williamsburg. Um, so, um, so the only place they really had ship houses that were effective was at Gosport Navy Yard. And in those ship houses were several ships of the line. And there were also several ships along the quay. Now, when the Federals abandoned the yard, they spend more of their effort trying to destroy the existing ships rather than some of the, like the foundry, uh, like uh, uh, several other equipment. I mean, there's $5 million loss in damage but the yard is still valued at over $5 million because of the dry dock. And so, no, they don't capture any. <clears throat> the burning of those ships enabled the Confederates to actually raise three ships where they have the diving bell. And so they raise the Merrimack, and we know what happens there. They raise the Germantown, which is a sloop of war, which they take down to um, Sewell's Point, and they'll fill her through her bulk words full of sand. So it becomes the first sand clad of the Civil War, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's my name. But that's what it was. So, no, they did not because of the destruction of the uh, uh, pre war materials. I'm going to go to one online and then back to the book. All right, Carolyn asks, what's the difference between a cannon and a shell gun? I knew you would wow, love that one. Wow, one of my favorite questions. Thank you. Um, so uh, who is that, Carolyn? Carolyn. Thank you. Um, so anyway, um, a smoothbore is cannon, is basically what we use during the Napoleonic period, uh, the first 30 years of the 19th century. These fired round shot, they fired chain shot, they could fire um, um, canister, but they are limited range. And you know, when you fire a solid shot at a wooden ship, what does that do? Well, it's gonna go, sometimes it bounces off the side. Sometimes it actually creates a nice little hole like that. And on the other side, some splinters for you, but you know, Actually, the victory at the Battle of Trafalgar was holed several times, but you had carpenters on the ship with these little plugs, right? That were like for an 18 pounder shot. They just went down there and plugged the holes. So, um, so it is not as devastating. It does not have great range. Um, the carronade is something that's developed as a smooth bore but it's a very short barrel. You go into the monitor center and you can see some examples thereof, as well as the effect of single solid shot actions against the ship. So they could be 42 pounder or 32 pounder, but it's the weight of the broadside and the way we fought naval battles back then, which was in parallel lines often, or you wanted to cross the T like uh, Nelson liked to do. And so this is all new in tactics, but the gun stayed the same. However, Henry Paxenhans develops uh, the shell gun, which means I have more built up um, iron so that I can have a greater explosive char charge to propel that explosive shell against a ship. Now, what made that so good is that when that explosive shell blew up next to the ship, you don't have a plug because it's a ragged hole, right? Then you have, of course, iron splinters and uh, uh, wooden splinters, and then you have sparks. 
And as you all know, sparks and a wooden ship are not a good mix. So it's John Dahlgren that takes Paxton Hunt's concepts and he's going to make in the, what is known as the Dahlgren gun, which is called the soda pop gun. You see how it's got a bigger build up at the base. So you can have that larger propellant, but what he does is his gun so it can fire solid shot, shell, canister. And so that makes it into a far more effective type of shell gun. And uh, so shell guns will be outdated, uh, you know, uh, by the end of the Civil War because we make rifled guns. We hear you and others talk about it all the time, but the aspect of raising a sunken ship at that time, uh, the, the technology had to be amazing. Did they use bladders? How did they do it? They're called camels. And so they'd pump air into the camels and the ship would come up and they would be managed by people in a diving bell. So um, basically uh, camels or bladders, but these are big. That's why they call them. Steam -driven pumps oh, they had steam. The entire Gosport Navy Yard had its own railroad system. Uh, it has um, a, uh, gas works. I mean, they, they're all ready to do any, it's the best repair and construction yard in the United States in 1861. So yeah, that was not a big deal. I mean, it was embarrassing. Oh my gosh. There was actually one ship, the dictator that they launched from a ship house down the ways like that, that wouldn't move down the ways, you know, and that was a, a, a monitor style vessel. So, you know, you can't grease those skids enough you get that huge vessel down. And so they, they could take them three times to make that happen. And had that thing sunk, I don't know whether they could have brought it up very easily, you know, because this is a big ironclad. Olivia, online question? Yes, and I will just um, go ahead and voice to those that are online that if we don't get to all of your questions here, um, John is going to put his email address up here so that you all can, you know, send him those questions and you all can follow up. Okay, I will combine a question here from Robert and Don because they are related. How do we know where all of the ships were located here in Hampton Roads? And then as a follow up, who at the union officer level at Hampton Roads was aware of the monitor's location and when she was en route? Okay, that's an easy answer. Number one, John Marsden receives a telegram that the monitor has cleared port on March 6. Okay, so that ship could have been here on March 8 if the seas had been nice, but instead the ship almost sank twice. So what that means is that it's a close call, but it doesn't make it. The Confederates know that the Monitor had left New York because the New York Times publishes a list of sailing vessels leaving port, right? And so, well, USS Monitor, you know, <laughs> and they know what that means. So they knew they had to get their ship out. Workmen were still on the CSS Virginia and Buchanan, the commander of the Virginia says, time for you all to get off. And so and down she goes because they knew, although Buchanan was not afraid of the monitor, I would say what there is a problem is, is that he has to, without the monitor there, he has all these wooden ships dead in his sights. He runs out of time on March 8th, but they're ready to get back at action the next day, uh, especially as one story goes, when they woke up on March 9th, the crew of the Virginia got two boiled eggs and two jiggers of whiskey to start their day. That's how I start every day. <laughs> Breakfast of champions. Yes. Uh, Olivia, was there another question? And, in, and another from the room. Yes, sir. We'll take this one. All right. Kind of a frivolous question and for that i apologize but to me the the picture you have of the dragon it looks like a modern tugboat uh, it's not much different um 
I'm going that's towards the it. only picture and I searched everywhere. Oh no, I, I just that and yeah, and so it's very similar to a modern tugboat. This case, it's a screw propeller, right? Mm -hmm. Now many of them were paddlers, uh, but uh, the screw propeller gives greater strength as they develop engines in a stronger way. It's got a lot of horsepower built into a small ship, so it can actually move a barge, move a one 1,700-ton ship wherever it wanted to. So you see them working in Hampton Roads every day. But uh, So the design's not far off. All right, I've got two more questions. So I'll ask the first one, and then we'll see where we're at with time. Um, why was more use not made of torpedoes and onshore batteries in an effort to bottle up Virginia? And uh, that question is from Stephen. Well, the reason why is because the Federals don't control the Elizabeth River. And so to get a fire raft to work, you have to push it with tugboats down towards the harbor up the Elizabeth River and then you're hoping the fire ship will bump into something, but it didn't always do that. And we see not as many fire rafts used during the Civil War. They are used during the Battle of the Passes and they're not successful. Torpedoes or mines, um, the Federals had not developed that technology to the same extent as the Confederates. They actually do have a floating torpedo that comes down into Hampton Roads, designed by uh, Robert Miner, uh, but it doesn't do anything. So uh, um, by 1860, late 1862, they are doing torpedoes or mines. They have no self-propelled torpedo back then. So it's either a fire raft or a, uh, um, a, or a torpedo which could be floated down. Confederates perfect the electronic torpedo, which is really uh, the best thing. You know, it's gotta have wires and they uh, ignite it from the shore. Um, thank you, John, appreciate it always. And you all have a great weekend, thanks.